a particular problem which is the cause of a lot of struggle and which is unfortunately faced by a great many people out there is the curse of an unhealthy and abusive childhood or family dynamic. I reckon this is probably one of the most detrimental issues which has surely faced us since the dawn of time, but which hasn't been given nearly enough weight by society until relatively recent times. I haven't really been too sure what to do with this channel after my Omori series, but thanks to a commenter, I was introduced to a short film which explores this very issue of the toxic family dynamic and the absolutely detrimental effects it almost always has on the children subjected to it. It's a film about how one individual seeks to escape from a reality so unbearable that a mere advertisement for burgers was enough to inspire the creation of a better one. I'm of course talking about Jack Stauber's short film Opal, released the day before Halloween 2020. Today, I'll try my best to unravel how the various characters and themes in this film are used to tell us something about the nature of mental abuse and its many facets, as well as its ultimate root in a lack of empathy. I've already spoiled the film somewhat, sorry, but if you'd like to avoid more extensive spoilers, I highly recommend watching the original film and forming your own interpretation of it before watching this video, as it seems to me that most art is best experienced blind. And although I'll be bringing in certain concepts from psychology in my analysis, keep in mind that I'm not a psychologist, and all of this is me simply outlining the associations and thoughts the film elicits in me. And of course, this video is an analysis of a film which largely deals with the theme of mental abuse, so be advised of that as well. I'll start by providing a very general outline of the film's progression, and then I'll get into the analysis. The film proceeds from the perspective of the main character whose name initially seems to be Opal, seemingly in the process of eating a burger for dinner. A kind family sings a song of encouragement to her. We see you, Opal, your troubles are miles away. We see you, Opal, and in our eyes you'll stay. Rather than eating the burger, she begins dancing on her plate whilst receiving support and encouragement from each of her respective family members. But after she notices a certain gloomy house outside her window, she's promptly put to bed by her caretakers. However, seemingly unable to contain her curiosity, she sneaks her way out in the dead of night, proceeding to that strange house at the other side of the street. A bright light flickers, scaring her and prompting her to enter, but in here, we're introduced to a very different set of characters when compared to the kind family we saw at the beginning. An old, aggressive man with an addiction to cigarettes and television. A younger, insecure and self-absorbed man engrossed in his own reflection, carrying out an incoherent monologue with himself. And lastly, a disturbing woman who grabs Opal's leg before going on and on about her own helplessness and the wrongdoings supposedly done against her. Opal is forced to endure the toxic idiosyncrasies of each of these people, who sing bizarre songs about their own perceptions and needs. It's presented as the witless exploration of what almost comes across as a kind of haunted house. There's a bizarreness to the whole situation, which I can certainly say bamboozled me a bit the first time I watched it. But they all call her by the name of Claire, not Opal. Who's that? Claire? Despite the foreignness of the place, a reality seems to slowly creep in on us. By the end of the film, Opal, or should I say Claire, locks herself into the attic, the place which seemed to mesmerize her from across the street, and she's suddenly brought back into that other world as the three people she faced knock frantically on the door. The song sung at the beginning receives a reprise. We see you, Opal. Your troubles are miles away. 
We see you, Opal, and in our eyes, you'll stay. Now on to the analysis. So, if you don't already know, thematically, this film is essentially about a girl who, in reality, lives in an extremely abusive family, forced to constantly suffer through three different variants of abuse from adults who are too absorbed in their own problems and personal demons to fulfill their responsibilities onto her. In reality, the house we initially see Opal in is merely a dream, a place where she has a different family and a different name. As a result of the constant demands and beratements of her elders, she dissociates from reality, represented by her locking herself in the attic. And like a certain other protagonist I've talked about extensively in the past, she creates a false world which functions as a kind of inversion, a positive reflection of reality where each of her family members sees her. But while she's enclosed in this dream world, existing completely within her head as evidenced by the cameras zooming out of her head at the end of the film, parts of reality seem to present themselves in her dream world in the form of the other house across the street. On the highest level, it's a condensed commentary on the nature of parental neglect, abuse, and most importantly for my analysis, the many different ways that a person can lose perspective of other people, the different types of toxic behavior that exist out there. There are many facets to explore, the many-sidedness of abuse, the loss of perception and empathy towards other people, and the victim's desire to escape presented in the form of dissociation. So, I'm going to structure my analysis as a discussion around a few different key concepts and themes, which I think are at the root of the issue that Stauber is trying to present in this film. Firstly, there are, like I said, many different facets of abuse, just like there are many facets of almost everything out there. This presents itself in the form of three quite different characters Claire comes across as she explores the house across the street. I think that each of the characters basically serves as a representative of one of three different forms of mental abuse and three different ways of being lost within oneself. They're almost like a collection of instructions on how to not ever treat, let alone raise a child. Just as an unhealthy and imbalanced family situation can have many aspects, beratement, physical abuse, neglect, gaslighting, and scapegoating, there are a number of very different ways that an individual can behave and treat someone else, especially someone vulnerable like a child, which can have a hugely detrimental effect. And some of these types of behavior are arguably not nearly as obvious or even obviously bad. As others. Let's start with a grandpa, who's the first character Claire encounters when she enters the real house. As soon as she enters, we immediately notice a pronounced physical contrast between the real house and the dream house, as piles of trash are littered throughout the floor. This of course reflects the emotional contrast between the two environments from Claire's perspective. While the dream house is harmonic, each family member exhibiting an appropriate degree of responsibility, Claire's real family is characterized by the lack of that responsibility, reflected physically by the fact that things which should have been cleaned up a long time ago are left out to rot on the floor. Like I briefly mentioned before, there's also a sense of foreignness to the whole thing, which is clear from the very beginning. Even though this is Claire's real house, the way she stumbles through everything, seemingly shocked or terrified at every corner, creates a very distinct feeling that this is not her home. The first time you watch, this might lead you to think that this is quite simply some sort of haunted house, like I said, which she's exploring. But knowing what the film is actually about, it becomes a chilling way to express how deeply alienated she feels within the confines of her own home the place that should have been a safe space to return to in times of need. Now, the most striking characteristic of the grandpa himself 
in terms of abusive traits is his aggressive and inconsiderate attitude towards Claire. As a parental figure, he presents as a person who forcibly imposes his will on her, coercively telling her to get his cigarettes, belittling her and accusing her of hiding them from him. Come here, I need you to bring me my cigarettes. Hey, don't think about hiding them again either. I know it's you who's doing that. His overall behavior and presentation to me establishes him as this very particular type of abuser. He's the aggressor of the family. The person most akin to the stereotypical abuser we think of when we hear the word. An individual with the habit of enforcing his will on others, violating personal space and dismissing any opinions or frustrations they might have. It's self-evident how this type of behavior constitutes abuse in a family situation. Treating a child this way is doomed to result in long-lasting trauma, especially when you combine his violent attitude with the inappropriate load of responsibilities that come with it. Beyond this though, like I hinted at before, a theme which repeats itself between each of the characters Claire encounters and which is presented more or less as the core issue at the root of abuse throughout the film is the lack of the abuser's ability to see outside of themselves. The song sung by Claire's imaginary family members is after all about how she's in their eyes and in their eyes she'll stay. This is in her dream world and in the reality at the other side of this dichotomous relationship, we see that there's a profound aspect of self-absorption to each of the real family members, of lacking that ability to see Claire. This is most obvious with the second character, who we'll get to in a minute, but it's very much also present with the grandpa. The grandpa is more or less delusional. We see this first of all in this peculiar quote, which sort of comes out of nowhere. Just like these people on television, Claire, you're far more interested in me than anything you got going on. He seems to have some delusion that Claire is somehow obsessed with him. And this delusion is expanded upon in his song, where he repeatedly insinuates that everyone on the television is specifically speaking, singing and dancing to him, as if he's special somehow. I'm popular here They all sing to me la, 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 la. This deluded narcissism borders on the paranoiac as he in fact claims that they want his soul and fight over him like dogs. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't think the billion dollar corporations advertising on television care that much about one single individual. And these delusions become a quaint analogy of the grandpa's physical blindness as he sings I can't see why it sounds so easy to breathe. On the one hand, he's at least partially blind, so he can't see what they're doing on television. But another kind of blindness is reflected here by the fact that he can't see the simple reality the reason it's so easy to breathe on TV is because he's a chain smoker with drastically reduced lung capacity. Finally, regarding the grandpa's delusions, there's one last detail which is interesting. Before Claire runs upstairs, he claims that she's not actually Claire and tells her to get out of his house. You're, you're not Claire. What are you doing in my house? Again, the first time you watch, this might make you think that Claire is in fact an intruder in his home, which is what the film suggests if you interpret it completely literally. But the second time you watch, it instead reads as a sign that the grandpa might in fact have dementia on top of all his grandiose delusions. This again builds on the feeling of alienation which Claire experiences in the household. And it also serves as a first hint towards another theme I think it's important to recognize. Namely, that despite their horrible behavior, each of these abusive characters 
actually do have their own problems, which are partially outside of their control. I'll talk more about that towards the end of the analysis. As Claire escapes upstairs after the grandpa seemingly doesn't recognize her, we now meet a second character whose abuse is radically different in nature. While the grandpa is presented as an aggressive individual who imposes himself on others in a very direct way, making him a kind of representative of your stereotypical abuser, Claire's father is a milder type of personality. His chief vice is clearly his all-consuming obsession with his own appearance, as evidenced by the fact that he sits in a chair in the bathroom seemingly all day, staring at his own reflection. In this regard, he's a prime example of the Narcissus archetype. The story of Narcissus, who was the origin of the term narcissist, is the archetypal Greek story of the man who loses himself in his own reflection. As a consequence of this, Narcissus loses contact with the outside world, remaining stuck in place, staring at himself for the rest of his life. In line with this, the form of abuse that Claire's father embodies is the denigration of others to heighten oneself. The compulsion to step on someone else because it serves to elevate your own self-image. In the same way that the grandpa is addicted to TV and cigarettes, the dad is addicted to the expedient dopamine kick he receives when glorifying himself at other people's expense. On the surface, he speaks rather mildly to Claire and seems to display something of a friendly attitude towards her, at least in tone. But hidden beneath that mild tone is a deep-rooted, unprocessed insecurity which has taken hold of his life. And now, whether he really means it or not, it pushes him to take every available opportunity to insult everyone else to make himself feel better. This also gives the character a clinginess, which plays a huge part in constituting the abusiveness of his behaviour. He basically freezes Claire in place, forcing her to stand by and listen to his self-absorbed rambling, all whilst being used as a stepping stone for his ego. And as a stepping stone, that weight, that obligation to be the person who fulfills the dad's desperate attempts to elevate himself, becomes a form of abuse to her. If she tries to walk away, he guilt trips her. Hey, where are you going? Whoa, you know how this makes me feel. But if she stays, she's likewise denigrated by being turned into the object of a one-sided conversation serving to relieve his insecurities. Like we see at the end of the film, she becomes his mirror, the thing which reflects a positive light onto him. But that's an enormous burden, one no one should have to bear, let alone a child. It's quite evident how the dad is out of touch with reality, how he is unable to see Claire, thus tying him in with the theme of perception. In his song, he sings about how he was rejected in the past and now sits in his reflection chamber, trying to fix himself. After all, he has to be seen by someone out there. They turned me down, now I live my nightmare. Gotta be seen by someone out there. But if he's the one who always has to be seen, he himself is never going to see anyone else. If you're looking into a maze of mirrors simply reflecting your own face, your ability to perceive other people and empathize with their unique circumstances and struggles completely disappears, hidden behind an impossible veil of your own construction. This is basically the lesson of the story of Narcissus and the life stories of many real narcissists out there. Don't lose yourself in your own reflection, lest you lose the ability to see other people and their predicaments. The last character Claire encounters as she traverses this alien home is her mother. This is arguably the most pitiful character of them all, serving as the representative of one of the most subtle forms of abuse. 
A hint of her toxic attitude is revealed in the very first line of her monologue. Claire, you need to be in person today, huh? As she grabs Claire's leg and pulls her down, forcing her to endure her drunken ramblings. This line expresses the attitude which permeates her entire relationship to Claire and the nature of its abusiveness. Similarly to Claire's father, her mother exhibits a clinginess and reliance on her to fulfill a certain idealized role in her life. But while the dad uses Claire as a kind of stepping stone for the elevation of his own ego, the mother instead engages in a kind of reversion of the mother-child relationship, using Claire as a pillow to provide her with emotional support. We see this most clearly expressed in her song, where she sings about how Mama needs a little girl to land on Mama needs a little girl to fall in her arms These lines reflect the perverse nature of this mother-child relationship. The mother imposing her own emotional needs on the child and relying on her as a kind of supportive shoulder to cry into, more like a best friend than a mother or a partner in trauma, so to speak, in an entirely one-sided way. And the backwards nature of this state of affairs is further hinted at in that Claire is referred to as a little girl in the lyrics, reflecting the reality that she is nothing but a child, a person who should never be burdened with this kind of unfair responsibility. In line with that, an attitude which we see very clearly with the mother is that of absolving one's own responsibility and agency in life. In her monologue, she repeatedly speaks of her own powerlessness, saying, Goodness exists. If I wait, Claire, and I sit still, it will arrive. This reflects an internalized attitude of victimhood and suspension of one's own agency. The mother is aware of the tragic situation which has emerged in the household, even saying that she feels terrible for it. But rather than take the necessary steps to improve the situation, she adopts a fixed mindset and perhaps unknowingly abuses and objectifies Claire by using her as a medicine to provide emotional relief, almost like a painkiller or a drug. Just another drug she uses to escape reality alongside alcohol, pills, and endless self-pity. Claire is pulled down alongside her mother, her agency taken away from her as she's declared just as powerless as I am. In this way, Claire's mother and father are somewhat similar in that they both use their daughter as a way to cope with, yet also perpetuate their own unhealthy emotional needs and obsessions. The difference between them lies only in the particular type of emotional need that each of them has. While the dad is obsessed with himself because he feels compelled to elevate himself in a toxic way, the mother is obsessed with herself because she's unable to elevate herself in a healthy way. Stuck in this inescapable pit of copium and self-piteous wailing. And in both cases, the abuse is sort of hidden behind a thinly veiled facade. The dad just wants to feel better about himself. The mother is powerless and she's sorry for how things got so bad. We can all recognize aggression when we see it, but this type of abuse is a little more subtle, especially the mothers. So I can imagine there are many people out there who blame themselves because they don't fully realize that. I'd be remiss not to mention another theme, which makes itself very clear with this character, but which I think is an important aspect of the whole message that the film is trying to express. Namely, the cyclical nature of abuse. In a kind of delusional manner, the mother refers to her own continuous forgiveness of the other members of the household 
as a virtuous cycle. I forgive every single one of you, every night. It's a virtuous cycle. Whilst this conveniently places her on an artificial moral pedestal, she does still have a point. There's a cyclical component to these kinds of abusive relationships, and they often transmit down the generations, perpetuating themselves until someone strong enough and brave enough to break the cycle comes along. Towards the end of her song, while she's lying on the ground, we zoom into the mom's eyes and see a vision of her trying to call 911 before being pushed to the ground by a man. This is clearly intended to show us that she too was abused in the past. I see some similarities between the figure in the vision and Claire's grandfather, so perhaps we might even speculate that this was her, the mother's father, abusing her when she was a child, just as she now abuses her daughter in a different way. In any case, the message that's being put across here is that abuse is cyclical, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. If someone abused in the past isn't able to relieve themselves of the burden placed on their shoulders, they may find that they in turn perpetuate the very same toxic behavior onto their relationships and become too stuck and submerged in their own trauma to realize that they're now perpetuating this infinite cycle. This also brings me to what I mentioned earlier about the fact that all the characters have certain problems which are outside of their control. This is true both in the sense that you aren't entirely responsible for the fact that abuse inflicted on you in the past can lead you to commit similar acts down the line, but also in a different way. For instance, the grandpa is blind, and accordingly, he needs help for basic things. That isn't his fault. Similarly, it's implied that Claire's father was turned down somehow, perhaps from a job or something, and now he's stuck in his reflection chamber. At times, we can hear a deeper voice interject with negative comments as he speaks, seemingly acting as a negative counterbalance to the dad's normally mild tone of voice. Sorry, my brain. Thanks. I often find myself at my wit's end in here. This seems to me to be his inner critic, the part of himself which is responsible for his endless insecurity and which constantly pushes him to desperately try to improve himself. And in a particular frame later on in the film, we see his real appearance, and not exactly the most charming individual. And again, those things aren't his fault. It isn't his fault that people don't find him attractive, and it isn't necessarily his fault that he was turned down. Finally, the mother is the easiest to see in this regard, seeing as she's been abused herself in the past. The bottom line is that all the characters have their own struggles, consequent from the cards they were dealt in life, and we sort of need to recognize that as well. The abuse only emerges once they let those problems take control of them and ruin the lives of others as a result. So then, we see why the theme of sight and perception runs as an essential thread throughout the short narrative of the story. Claire lives in a family where nobody sees her. Everyone is operating on a different level, symbolized by the multitude of stories of the real house, as opposed to the one story of the dream house, and the fact that each of her real family members has their own window on the facade as she sees it from across the street. They all speak in monologues because they lack the ability to take in anyone else's point of view. Claire says nothing at all because that's what she's been taught to do. And so instead, she constructs an imaginary reality where everyone does see her. Her imaginary family members are subtly designed to indicate what each of them lack in reality and what she correspondingly wants from them in her dream world. She dreams of a world where her mother gives her encouragement. Go on, you can do it. 
rather than wailing on about how helpless they both are, how impossible it is to change anything. She dreams of a world where her father actually acknowledges her for who she is and what she accomplishes. Rather than using her to pull himself up. And she dreams of a world where her grandfather actually recognizes her. Her name here is Opal, a name shared with a gemstone because she dreams of a world where she is seen as having actual value. A person with her own life rather than a pair of eyes, a mirror and a pill for each of her family members respectively. Through each of the characters we're acquainted with the many facets of psychological abuse and the many ways in which a person can be lost within themselves. Some people are lazily submerged in addictions and grandiose delusions. Others are too insecure to maintain a reasonable relationship with the outside world. And some choose to bury themselves, resigning themselves to the hopelessness of their circumstances, thus preventing any positive action and dragging others along with them. When Clary eventually reaches her room in the attic, Reality dawns on her once again, after having dissociated herself away. The reality that this house she's been exploring, it's not some haunted house. It's hers, and this is her real family. Reality has become clear once again. In this specific moment, we're really pushed to empathize with her, to understand, for a moment, what it feels like to live in a family like this. And ultimately, that's what Opal is all about. As viewers, we can show Claire the empathy she was never shown by her real parents by seeing this sort of situation and recognizing how horrible it is. Thanks for watching. We see you, Opal, your troubles are miles away. We see you, Opal.